Hello, everyone. Welcome to another virtual event with Mysterious Galaxy. Today, I have two wonderful authors. Hello. Um, first off, we have Gareth L. Powell. Gareth, hello. Hi. Uh, he is the B the multi BFSA award winner and science fiction writer. His Embers of War novels are currently being adapted for television. Joining in conversation with him is J. Diane Dotson. Hi, Diane. Hi. Uh, she is the author of the Quest Reason uh, saga series of books, a science writer, content writer, and manager, short story writer, watercolorist, and illustrator, and not only that, a great friend of Mysterious Galaxy. Hello. <laughs> Pleasure, Nick. Thank you. No, thank you for, for being here. Um, how's your days going so far? Good. Good, yeah. It's almost over here. So. I was going to say, it's actually, so everyone who is not aware, uh, Gareth's in the UK. He's wonderful and able to join in on an event with us uh, via the internet, just in case there's a little lag or any refreshing that happens. That is why. So please bear with the internet gods. I pray to you. <laughs> Today, we are here for Gareth's latest novel, Stars and Bones. I hope you all, yay. I hope you all have your copies out there. Yes, all three of us are matching. <laughs> Um, if you haven't yet bought your copy, you can definitely get one through Mysterious Galaxy. Uh, we do ship, uh, right down there at the bottom of the screen, you say, uh, you'll see a link that says buy stars and bones to get a signed book plate because Gareth is offering these signed book plates to come with your books. They look very snazzy. Uh, very good print job too. Uh, and yeah, uh, yes, and for any of your purchases out there, remember it does support Mysterious Galaxy, so we can continue doing wonderful events with wonderful authors like these two. Um, and if you have any questions you want to ask Gareth during the event, click another link below that says Ask Question. It looks like we already have one in there. One of you are wise and wonderful and already know how to do that. Hello, everyone. Um, and that'll be answered later on in the discussion. I'm going to go ahead and disappear for now and leave it to Gareth and okay. Diane to take it away from here. But I'll see you all later in, after the program. Thank you. Okay, so we're just waiting and Gareth may need to reconnect because of the time difference. There you are. Hi, Gareth. Can you hear me? Yep, I am. Yes. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you? Am I coming through okay? okay. You are. For a minute, you were gone. So. Now you're back. So we will go ahead and thank you for joining us, Gareth. And thank you, Mysterious Galaxy, for hosting this event. And I'm so excited that, you know, some of you may know that Gareth is actually my fiance. So I'm going to disclose that first. And he has never had an American book launch. And so Stars and Bones is now available. And as Nick said, there's a link at the bottom of the screen here that you can buy and get a signed book plate. So welcome, everyone. I'm going to ask Gareth some questions about the book and about his work. And then after that, I will reach out to the questions that you all ask. So please ask questions down below. And then later in the show, we will answer some questions. So thanks again, Gareth. So Stars and Bones has just recently come out. Tell us about it. What's it about? Oh, it's about 300 pages. Um, <laughs> it's uh, sorry. Um, it's a story set seventy-five years or so into the future, when humankind has been uh, kicked off the planet um, by superior alien intelligence because we've been making a mess of it and blowing ourselves up and trashing the environment and so on. Um, I didn't mean it to be quite as topical as it is. Um, mm. I started writing it two years ago um, when the idea of a, a, a nuclear war in Europe seemed remote and slightly far-fetched. Um, so the fact that the Russians decided to invade Ukraine just as the book came out was just a bit too yeah. topical for my liking. Yeah. But um, so it's, in, in that setup, it's a little bit like Battlestar Galactica in that humanity has been set adrift in a vast fleet of arcs to roam the stars. Um, but when they get out there, they find that the universe is slightly more horrifying than anyone could have predicted. And the action follows a scout pilot called Erin who runs ahead of the fleet in her scout ship, which is called the Furious Ocelot. And 
her sister disappears while it, d making the rookie mistake of investigating an alien distress beacon. Um, so Erin goes on a follow-up mission to try and find out what happened to her. And things take a very dark and horrific turn. And you'll have to read the rest of the book to find out why. Yeah, so it's a it's action packed from the start, and I feel like it's it's got a lot of heart. So it's got so many things going on with it, but it's carried mostly through the eyes of Erin, who's the main character, and she endures a lot of trauma and heartbreak in this story. But she has to work through all of these emotions and the attack of a new monstrous life form that could threaten all of humanity. So, you know, how does how did you approach writing Erin and making her go from, you know, a place of pain to a place of leadership? And how much of Erin is you? Um, well, I mean, we've we've all kind of been on a bit of a journey these last couple of years. Um, yes. Probably, you know, I, I can't remember. Okay, there's a bit of a lag. So we'll see if he comes back. The distances are large here in time and space. So Gareth, we can't hear you on my end. So you might want Gareth, to you might just have to refresh your browser again. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, it's going to be happening a little bit today. <laughs> yeah. Hang tight. We'll get Gareth back. I think someone needs to make a sacrifice to the internet gods. <laughs> I think so. Light some candles or something that safely. It's been a bumpy connection. But while we're waiting, I can read to you the back of the book so that you know more about it. Oh, that'd be wonderful. So the human race has been cast from a dying earth to wander the stars in a vast fleet of arcs. The head of the fleet flies the scout ship, the Furious Ocelot, crewed only by Captain Aaron King and a snarky talking cat, which is basically my favorite character in the book. When Aaron's sister disappears during a routine mission, she insists on being part of the crew sent to look for her. What she discovers on the planet Candidate 623 is both terrifying and deadly. When the threat follows her back to the fleet and people start dying, she is tasked with seeking out a legendary recluse who may just hold the key to humanity's survival. So when I, I've read the book, and as we wait for Gareth to come back, I can assure you that if you like Battlestar Galactica and you like The Thing and you like space opera, this is your book. So, and it is the beginning of a series. So we will talk about that when Gareth returns. Hopefully soon. I'll Nick, jump I in see for you. now to help. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, did, did Gareth, while we wait for Gareth to reconnect, because again, the Internet Gods and Dennis, I hope your donut right. sacrifice uh, does help out here. <laughs> Thanks, um, Dennis. So did uh, Gareth at all mention, uh, did he have any, because a lot of his books, I think, have also the similar uh, sci-fi covers. So just going off the covers, right. is this something that he normally gets to pick, or is it just his publisher going, yeah, we think this says sci-fi, so we're putting this cover on it. Did he happen he, to mention any of that? He has some feedback, and I have some covers of his back behind me. Light Chaser is a collaboration between him and Peter F. Hamilton. And then his books, the Embers of War series. Uh, I can show you those if you want and show you the covers because they are very much, you know, spaceship, planet, things going on, attacks and things like that. He has some feedback that he can give, but I think by and large, the cover design is managed by the publisher and then he sort of is shown and gives you know his nod or not so he did have some say in that because i know that's usually like that's how it usually is authors uh, right. have signed contracts that say yeah you really don't have creative input um really on the cover we will take your opinions into consideration but ultimately if the the publishers uh, either have like an in-house designer that they typically go with. It's like, yeah, you, these are the designs. Um, if right. you're lucky, you get to choose one of them that they've done. <laughs> exactly. And he also has upcoming, a special hardback set of Embers of War that's coming out, I believe in the summer. 
And that is Ooh. a very different set of covers, not just the art, but it's hardback with a nice jacket. So those books are coming from a smaller publisher and not Titan Books as I understand it. Uh, so that artwork, I was able to see some of it and he sent me, you know, Embers of War and then Fleet of Knives and Light of Impossible Stars. So that's all of the Embers of War trilogy. And it was really cool to see sort of a back and forth between what the artist had come up with and his feedback for what, you know, Trouble Dog, the iconic sentient ship of the Embers of War series looked like, you know, and so these covers are really beautiful and, and very different from the, you know, the existing covers. So. Um, did you get a chance to read any of the drafts before uh, the final copy? I was able to, I do have sitting behind me, that's an ARC. So an advanced review carp copy that I was able to have in late summer, which was very exciting. And just in time for me to be flying back and forth to England to see him. And so I had something for the plane and then I took it on a train to San Diego for a convention there and just been reading it ever since. So finished it, I guess a couple of months ago. And so, yeah, I was able to read that. And I'm also, he's also given me some samples of the sequel to read, which Ooh. is very exciting. I and definitely don't want, I don't want to talk about the sequel we're not while he's not on screen, well, but yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I will say it's what I've read is beautifully written. So he has a way with words for sure. So audience, if you're just joining us, we're having connectivity issues with England. We've been having them since before the talk began. And so we're just discussing Gareth's work. Looks like he's coming back. Yay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I think John's uh, cake sacrifice of the gods is what put, ultimately did it. John, cakes and donuts are... have been sacrificed. Oh my gosh! Um, if right. we have to move, if we have to move up, I think we have cookies in the next room. I'll I can grab the cookies. So I'm yeah. gonna disappear for now. So Gareth, we've been talking about your book covers, and I read the back of Stars and Bones for the audience. So and I talked about the creative input that we authors have with book cover design. So which has been very cool. And I was asked if, you know, I'd read any samples of the books, you know, and so I said, yes, but didn't reveal anything. So we'll keep going. So okay. in terms of how much uh, Aaron is you, we were talking about that and how you, how you made Aaron and, and her feelings and what she's going through come alive. I, I, well, I mean, Aaron comes from um, you know, all my characters are basically a part of me in some way. Um, and she's got a very tragic backstory um, entwined with her sister um, and her, the relationship she's had with her sister as well over the years. And um, so when her sister goes missing, that's that's sort of a catalyst for all those feelings. Um, I think in terms of... of um, emotionally we've all been on a, a bit of a bumpy ride since about 2015 um i don't know whether it was you know that squirrel that went into the large hadron collider that threw us into the wrong timeline or or, or what have you but everything seemed to go a bit wrong from about 2015 so we've all been on a kind of doom scrolling um roller coaster since then with with I mean, over here we've had Brexit and you've had Trump and, and now we've got the pandemic and, and cli climate collapse and, and World War Three and everything. So we, we're all kind of stressed out and Erin uh, is very much a, a woman of our times. So she's got a lot to deal with, um, living through very apocalyptic events. Um, but at the same time, she's just trying to look after... Um, her niece and find her sister so in some ways her her concerns are very grounded and very human like right. the rest of us um well there's all, all this um stuff going on around it so yeah so i just try to make her as grounded and as normal and authentic as possible in order to contrast and kind of be the reader's guide through the massive events and the huge um, scientific things that, that happened during this, uh, the course of the book. Yes. And it's a, it's a really rich world that you've built. You know, it's stunning. You have the arc ships and tell us about those and how their sentient avatars work. 
well, the the arc ship. There's a thousand arcs, and they're each uh, roughly twenty five miles long. So they're sort of the size of uh, Manhattan Island, I think. And they're just um, and they got many decks, so you can fit many millions of people in each one. Um, so the entire population of the Earth is is spread amongst these thousand arcs. And there are little transfer booths, uh, so you can step from one arc to another instantaneously through little wormholes. So it's like a big town, really, um, and you can move around. But different groups of people have kind of congregated and formed their own little societies within this um, within this fleet. So you have uh, sort of uh, you have groups who are living a sort of fully automated space communism lifestyle on one hand and you have groups who are trying to reintroduce some form of capitalism on the other you have uh groups who just who have adjusted themselves into be amphibious and spend half their time underwater and the rest of the time lying on the beach um and you know there's all so there's all different communities all interacting and it's a great big sort of hodgepodge of society contained in these thousand arcs and the arcs themselves um, are intelligent in that they as so that they can look after the humans on board and they've gradually they all started out the same but they've gradually altered themselves over the course of their 75 year voyage um to reflect a their own personalities and b the personalities of the uh characters and um occupants on board so i think we have a cat distraction Topically, there is a talking cat in Stars and Bones, as I mentioned earlier. So I have a feeling there is a talking cat. cat. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, and and so these ribs. Yeah, well, like I, the, the talking. Go ahead. Uh, big pun. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh -oh, we've frozen again. Bear with us, technical. Okay. Can you hear me, Gareth? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, but you're going in and out on the screen. But um, if you can keep speaking, mm. we'll just keep speaking. Okay. We were talking about talking cats. Um, well, yes, the um, the talk. I hear a cat. I know that the, cat. <laughs> yes. he's the, the one in the book isn't as chaotic as this one. <laughs> it's true. A bit more lazy. Um, this one has just decided after a day of sleeping to go absolutely crazy behind me on the floor with a, very, with a ball and a bell and all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I tried to make him as cat-like as possible in the book. So he's he he's very recognisably, you know, a talking cat, but he talks like a, what you would expect a cat to say rather than a person in a cat suit. So right, he's very, you know, there's a, there's a point where the ship is in danger and everyone's about to die, and he's just sitting there going, "Yes, but when am I going to get fed?" So of course, it, he's very much got a cat's concerns. But as for the avatars for the ships of the fleet of the continuance and continuance being referring to the continuance of the human race, essentially, right? So the avatars themselves yeah. having different personalities comes into play. The Furious Ocelot particularly interacts with the main character, Aaron, quite a bit. And the Furious Ocelot is fascinating to me. And I don't know, I, I, I felt like I bonded a lot with, with that avatar and... So I wondered if you had any um, inspiration for that character in particular. Yeah, I was, um, I va very vaguely based him on, oh, what's his name? Oh, my mind's gone completely blank. Uh, is, that an, is it Sydney Green Street? No. Is it an, an actor who's in Casablanca and the Maltese Falcon? I think he plays a character called Gutman in the Maltese Vulcan, very rotund, jolly gentleman. Um, so I vaguely based him on that actor. Um, I'm sure someone in chat can, uh, um, yeah, can uh, can find out who that is and 
inform us but faster than my memory can dredge it up but i i vaguely based him on 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 that actor um and i just wanted to make a re- yeah i just wanted to make um a relationship that was kind of kind of uh, parental so he's kind of acting very paternally towards erin um and very patiently and he's he's become very protective of her um but without kind of letting her know that so she's kind of sees him as colleagues whereas he's secretly sort of being very paternalistic towards her um and he's sort of very avuncular until he's pushed and then he becomes you see he can become something much more than he appears to be right and these are not holographic avatars for the ship they can interact yeah with Matt. So I found that interesting too, and yet be able to change. So that was fascinating. And I, in terms of, you know, we talked about the ships and the continuance and having each of them have this sort of unique population. It's almost like they're islands in space, you know, how you become isolated and you can develop this own culture. But with the flick terminals, which teleport you between the ships, I think that's a pretty interesting way to deal with it. So they're not completely cut off, but they still have that really cool world building. So that was, that was a really neat factor of the book. And so I enjoyed that a lot. And, you know, talking about Aaron, you, in other books of yours, particularly Embers of War, you write some really strong, but rough around the edges characters, women characters, particularly that I really have enjoyed bonding with. Aaron is no exception. Like, Sal Constance and Embers of War, you know, so the, these are flawed characters who have a past that either they're running from or trying to reinvent themselves from in a lot of ways. And I, I think that when they're plunged into these extraordinary circumstances where you have an, you know, an end of humanity potential scenario, you know, like how do you, like, did you have any inspiration aside from what you've gone through yourself in life, especially the last few years, channeling all that? Did you have any characters out there that sort of inspired Aaron or Sal or any of them that you drew I th- from that a bit? I think there's there's one character who's kind of inspired my writing more than any other, I think. And that's pro- probably this girl. Um, <laughs> that's uh, Ellen Ripley from Alien. Yeah. Um, especially from the first film before she became a, like an action heroine in the second film. In the first film, she's just doing her job mm-hmm. and she wants to get back to her daughter and she's, you know, just, you know, just trying to get through the shift and um, get home. And that kind of spoke to me very much. And it's something I, I kind of was reinforced when I discovered William Gibson's writing as well. Oh, yeah that the characters weren't kind of super capable Captain Kirk types. They were just people trying to get on with, you know, make a living. Um, yeah. And, and you know, that, that kind of resonated. So I kind of, I, I don't really write about emperors or, because I don't know anything about being an emperor. So I kind of write about being a normal person just doing a job because we've all been there and we've all done that. And so, and we've all had, you know, the things that are important to us are our families and um, earning a living and staying alive. And those are the things that are important to my characters as well. Um, and these great huge events happen to them and they have to dig down inside themselves and find the kind of the strength to keep going. And it's like Ripley does in Alien, the strength to, to blow the monster out the airlock with a harpoon gun. So it's... Um, it just will you stop it? Do we need to see the cat? <laughs> we need to strangle the cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's small wonder that a cat appears in Garrett's fiction because this little fellow here, Nico, is quite a character in and of himself. He's a pest. He's a <laughs> oh, giant I love him. pest. Yeah. <laughs> He's my buddy. So thank you. And so now let's talk about the monster. Because we've talked about the characters you have to face this thing. So let's talk about the monster in Stars and Bones. What can you tell us about this creature, this entity, and what's it doing? And why is it so scary? I 
don't want to give too much away because obviously the, the the reveal of what the creature is 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 a, is a fairly big reveal quite late on in the book. But what what it does is it is very curious, and it's very very curious about how things work, especially things like human beings. And so it takes them apart to sort of find out how they work. Um, and it uses things it finds and incorporates them into itself. And in some ways, it's kind of like the thing from the 1982 movie. Um, right. But in other ways, it's, 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 I'm trying to think what else it's, it's kind of like, but it's sort of that kind of vibe, especially at the beginning of the book where you're not sure what's happening. Right. There's a bit of assimilation vibe going on, not just from this thing, but if you think of the board from Star Trek, the next generation, yeah. and, you know, subsequent shows and movies, there's a little bit of that, like, you know, this, this thing taking over and not understanding why anybody would want to resist it, you know, like, yeah. So that, I thought that was pretty scary. And it's not just taking over people, it's taking over structures and that makes it extra scary. Yeah. It's, it, you don't know it's, like it's happening like an infection of not only people, but of the ships in the continuance. Yeah. It, it starts to take apart um, vessels and people and just everything it can get its hands on and, and personalities. And it gradually becomes more sophisticated as the book goes along and starts to come up with plans and stuff. But um at the beginning, it's just, it's like the Borg um, in that it's just this implacable force that's just moving forward. And there's a lot of sort of, if anyone's read Peter Hamilton's uh, Reality Dysfunction, there's this kind of, this idea of this completely, su almost supernatural, unstoppable force just moving through humanity and, you know, just what can we do? Yeah. And, and there's that there's a similar kind of horror vibe going on there as well because bits yes. get pretty pretty grisly. So. Well, yeah, it's definitely cosmic horror. It's extremely gory in parts and and brutal, you know, and, and which makes it extra scary because this thing doesn't respect, you know, our physical beings. Just literally ripping us apart, you know, and making this sort of weird hodgepodge of of stuff out of us in there in the ship. So scary stuff and you know having to face this and then also having that question of like has this somebody take been taken over by the thing you know and is you know they're trying to stop this thing from infecting the entire fleet through those flick terminals that connect the fleet so it's just a race against time to try to stop it and it seems absolutely unstoppable so you know i i was like tense throughout this whole book going you know what what can possibly stop something this powerful and this crazy and unable to be reasoned with you know so that was just fantastic and constantly being on top you know and having to deal with you know that urge of the what aaron's gone through that the loss and the grief that she's trying to seek a some sort of resolution to or if not a resolution at least you know reach a peace with and she can't because there's constant chaos around her and that we've all been through that the last couple of years especially like you can't reach that sense of peace when things are just going crazy around you and people you know are being harmed or worse. So I just felt like this was just very much, this is the book for right now. And it's, you didn't mean for it to be, but that's just how it happened. So, it's, and so, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, this is part of a series, which I won't spoil anything for anyone, but you know, it, it, it sounds like there's so much potential for storytelling in the universe that you've built that I can't wait to see what happens next, first of all. But, you know, you're writing space opera and you wrote Embers of War, the trilogy that, the you know, the first book is being adapted for the screen and being shot to networks. And you've read, you know, a new version of the script. And let's talk about the writing of space operas. Like what, what inspired you to write space opera science fiction versus let's say something like Michael Crichton would have written, you know, about DNA. So why space opera? Um, well, I mean, I, when I started off, um, I was trying to write, you know, I started off trying to write literary fiction at university because that's what was expected and struggled. And in the end, someone just said, you need to write what you love. And so, 
I went to my bookshelves and it was all science fiction and it was just a no-brainer. It was just like, and I was like, oh, hang on, you mean I can actually do this stuff? You know, I can I can get away with doing this stuff? That's brilliant. So I just, you know, I, I just went with my first love and started writing books that I would want to read. Um, and I love books about, you know, a, from sort of Han Solo onwards, I'm just a sucker for the grizzled space captain, mm -hmm. you know, just um, an alien as well, and all those kind of used futures, um, just that kind of that kind of thing. So I just, you know, I've just gravitated straight towards um, what appealed to me and kind of built a, my own aesthetic out of all the bits. So you've got some cyberpunk, you've got some, so there's some Blade Runner, there's some Alien, there's some, um, and then there's just all the new space opera of the sort of uh, 1990s and 2000 of, of like uh, Ian Banks and John Harrison. Um, right. All, all those writers as well who were, were writing when I, when I was just starting out, I was uh, absorbing all their work as well. So it's it's, you know, I think very much kind of third generation space opera. And it seems to, it seems to be a, a good time for it because you have a lot of new space opera coming out. Um, yes, from sort of Meg, Megan O'Keefe and um, oh, every time when Becky Chambers, yeah, well, my mind goes blank. But there's, but interestingly, there's um, unlike the turn of the, the millennium where it was the new space opera it was all dudes. This is a much more diverse. Um, range of voices now coming out which is a, which is fantastic uh, so, uh aliette de Bodard, uh laura lamb um and and you know the, there's just some fantastic fantastic books out there there's far more than i mentioned because i'm terrible with names at the mm -hmm. moment which is uh, um <laughs> i think a hangover from brain fog from um the pandemic i can't just cannot remember names at the moment but um yeah, so the I think it's a stronger field than ever. Um, yeah, we, and it, it always it golden age doesn't doesn't it? Sorry. Yeah, I as I think I said on Twitter, it's like the background radiation of the sci-fi genre, in that it's always there. There's always space opera. Sometimes it's more kind of prominent than other times. It sort of ebbs and flows. So you, you get like a a new generation of space opera writers, and then it kind of ebbs away and everyone gets into sort of dystopias or whatever but it's always rumbling away in the background and we can expect more space opera from you right yes the uh, stars and bones universe was purposefully designed that i could tell lots of different stories in it um so what it was sold to titan what they wanted um was a series of books that could be read in any order so um, Excellent. that's cool yeah so that people could just sort of what they call onboard the series at any point mm. without having to go back and buy a book that was published three years ago and then read four more books to read the latest one they could just um i think their model was like ian banks's culture universe where you can just pick one up and read it um but then you get you can explore more and it becomes richer from reading more but you don't have to read in any particular order so oh, like at the moment, there's one more planned, which I'm writing at the moment. Um, but I, there's certainly scope to come back to this universe again and again. Excellent. That's great. Now, in terms of you talk about having pandemic brain, and yet somehow you got Stars and Bones finished during this incredibly stressful time. So what helped you get through that? You know, as, as a writer myself, I know what I went through, and maybe other writers and readers would like to know, how did you push through such a difficult, challenging time, which you mentioned the, the acknowledgement for the book, that it was a hard thing to write. So how did you push through that and get it done? And well, after that, we will start taking the questions from the audience. Okay. Well, obviously, um, in the middle of the pandemic, I found myself writing a book about a mysterious infection that was endangering humanity and quarantine controls and all these things that had just been part of the story when I'd planned it, but it was suddenly very, very pressing. Um, so it was like the opposite of escapism. Um, mm. I just had to, you know, I, for a long time, I, I, this, this, I actually delivered this book a, a year late. Um, it was supposed to have been d 
delivered in 2020, but I delivered it in 2021 um, because it was, um, so it's supposed to have been published this time last year, um, but it's published this year instead because, yeah, like everyone else, I shut down over the pandemic. It was impossible to, to write and to be banging up against these really weighty subjects that I was right. also having to cope with in real life as well were was difficult but you know I just in the you know just had to keep plodding on one word in front of the other um and then gradually it picked up um momentum again and I I, I finally finished it but it was uh, it was not easy in places it had me worried for a few months I thought maybe my career had stalled and I'd lost the I'd lost the knack but um luckily it, it, it sort of all, the mojo came back in time just in time and i'm glad it did because it's a fantastic book i love it and i know everybody else is going to love it too and you know having writing books during pandemics is something i can relate to and it, it it's been very difficult so i feel like you know the nice thing is is that it seems like people want books and you know mysterious galaxy bookstore is a, is a rich tre treasure trove an independent bookstore where you can get books like ours and support a small business and we are small businesses ourselves and so it's sort of an ecosystem where we're all helping each other we're helping each other escape and we're creating and i think those two things are how we make it out of the most difficult situations so thank you for answering my questions and now i'm going to turn it over to the audience and go see what questions we have there all right so from Dennis. Hi, Gareth. If you had the chance to travel to the future, what technology would you most hope to see? Uh, I think probably um, some kind of technology to help us through the, the the climate crisis. So sort of carbon capture technology, um, atmospheric scrubbing, some kind of global cooling something i'm not sure what it would be but i hope there would be something that would have been invented um so that when i got to the future it was it was still habitable that would be i think that has to be top of the list um you know i don't want that i wouldn't want to get to the future and find a desert and then a few bones of the elon musk expedition on mars it would just be um <laughs> You know, I'd, I'd want to get to the future and find, you know, at the very least something like the Federation where they managed to sort everything out and, you know, it, it nice. was a, a nice place to be. Yeah, definitely. A good question. Okay. Next question. From Marie. Hi, Gareth. I loved Stars and Bones. I still have a huge book hangover after reading it. I want to ask about the ship on voice. When did you get the idea of for them first come to you sorry when did the idea for them first come to you and what influenced their different variations thank you so much um i i first kind of thought of the idea quite a few years ago and put it down in a, a notebook but i didn't have a story to, to tell at the time so um i kind of resurrected it when i was building the world um here as for the the various variations in the ships i just kind of had fun with them uh, they're kind of they're all sort of named after things from earth that um the people may want want to remember um so there's one i think called the great barrier reef there's one called uh, the great wall of china there's one called the library of alexandria and so on but there's a thousand of them so there's room for i think a couple of them are named after song titles on the blade runner soundtrack album if you look hard enough um and i kind of just try to give them their own personality so one is sort of australian um he's configured his internal space to be a big like ocean with uh, sand and uh, coral reefs so that people can sail and ski and, and scuba dive and what have you cool. um and his his uh, envoy is a, a hammerhead shark um and he's just kind of got that kind of uh, sort of very positive australian vibe to him and some of them are more serious uh, some of them, and some of them are more sort of caring some of them are slightly more militaristic so i just kind of had fun coming up with these different ships i think there's there's definitely a, an influence uh, i was definitely aware of the influence of ian banks um and tried to kind of that 
they said of Hemingway, half the writers in the 20th century tried to write like him and the other half tried not to. And <laughs> whenever you have sentient ships, you have to try either to write like Ian Banks or not to write like Ian Banks because he covered that ground. So, so I was aware of his influence and there is some influence there definitely, but I tried to make them very distinct and make the concept my own. Um, and hopefully I managed that. I think you did. I think it's one of the most fascinating aspects for this new series and definitely for the book itself. All right. Okay. Are the two of you planning a collaboration? If so, can you talk about what it's about? And well, we have talked about it. We would love to collaborate. Gareth, do you want to commit, comment on that? Yeah, well, we, we've chatted around sort of outlines for a couple of uh, potential novellas that we thought we might have a bash at writing. Um, I am at the moment up to my elbows in the first draft of the sequel to Stars and Bones, so um, I'm not really in a position to be working on anything else at the moment because deadlines are getting very tight, but um, hopefully at some point in the future we've got these uh, novellas planned and we, we might uh, bang out a couple of them and see what happens. Yeah, I'm hoping so, because we've got some really great ideas I, I know everybody yeah. would love. And we seem to have a good sort of, obviously a rapport, but also our writing styles aren't exactly alike, but they can blend enough so that we can tell a good story, I think. So fingers crossed. Yeah. All right. How much world building do you create before writing the first draft? Thank you, Alan, for the question. Um, I, I usually create a very, very vague world building and it's usually just in my head as opposed to being notes. So there's no great kind of, I, 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 I coming up with a thousand arcs, I, I made a spreadsheet and I thought, right, I'll write down all thousand names. I got to about 12 and gave up, um, <laughs> and just made the rest up as I went along. Um, and that's how I do most of my world building is I will make it up as I go along to fit the needs of the story. Um, so once I've got the basic setup, like in Embers of War, I kind of had the basic setup of the war and the two sides who'd fought and then the, the larger community of alien species around humanity. I had that, but then everything else I made up as I went along. Um, so it was, yeah, it was because I thought, right, I need this for the story or this would, this would work well in the story. So I'm not somebody who comes up with like a rigid world building and then fits the story into it. I, I fit the world to the story um, because the story, I think, for me, is and the characters are the most important thing. So the world has to showcase them and give them time to shine. So, yeah. Great. All right. Here's a question from, from Rusty. Welcome, Rusty. Is it more fun developing a hero or heroine or the villain? Hmm. It's a good question. I'm not sure because none of my characters consider themselves villains. Mm. Every character considers themselves the hero of their story. So right. I'm basically, I'm developing a lot of heroes, uh, especially in, in, in Embers of War, I tried to make um, Ona Sudak, even though she's, arguably the villain of the of the trilogy i tried to make her a sympathetic character um right from the get-go um because everything she's doing she's doing for her you know because she thinks she's doing the right thing and she's doing it for um uh, for all the right reasons as far as she's concerned um i tried to write slightly more cartoonish villainous characters for the Akak Makak trilogy, because that's the kind of trilogy it was. Um, but even then, they still kind of had motivations. They weren't just being evil for the sake of it. They thought what they were doing was the right thing. So, yeah, it's it's kind of... ...do some bad shit as well. So there's kind of grey areas. Um, yeah. The, you know, the, there, are, there are times when the heroes will do something that can be slightly morally questionable but they believe they're doing the right thing. And then the villain does something that's not really questionable. So it's, it's kind of in some ways perspective. Um, so, but they, yeah, they're all fun. If you approach them that way and try to make them authentic characters in their own right, then that's, that that's just fun. It is indeed. Okay. Dennis asks Gareth, 
What was the most important element for you in writing this story? What did you want to make sure you got absolutely right for readers? I think, I think this is my angriest story. Hmm. This was the story, um, sort of politically. Um, I, I mean, I don't hit anybody over the head with the politics in the book, but if you if you look, it's there. And I'm I'm pretty angry about the state of the world. I'm pretty angry about the idea of leaders um, and what they get listened to, and so I take kind of the world as we are now and shove it onto a um, a fleet of arcs which is a post-scarcity society where the arcs provide everything the people need and these people come from you know one of the characters is the richest man in the world and he has to suddenly adapt to living on in in a, the rest of humanity where everybody is equal and how do we cope with that uh, human nature's work in that way so it, in a lot of ways I haven't come up with any definitive answers but there's a lot of anger in the book um, and I kind of wanted to kind of showcase society today by showing different approaches to it and different perspectives on it through these different kind of each arc is like a thought experiment in how society could be organized. Um, so from that point of view, it was, it, it, that was kind of, that, that was important to me was to, to vent a lot of my, my uh, frustration at the world, but to do it in, instead of just a, by yelling on Twitter, but to do it in a, 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 a novel, so that, uh, yeah. Productive use of time and, you know, creativity there. All right, Dennis also asks, last question, I promise, well, maybe, in books, movie, or television, what is your favorite sci-fi universe? Ooh. That's the difference between what's my favorite and which one would I like to live in? There may be a distinction there. Maybe answer both. So, I mean, yeah. Um, I think my favorite is just from the fact that I've loved it since I was six years old is probably Star Wars. Um, I have a very um, interesting relationship with Star Wars in that some of it I've loved with all the fiber of my being since I was a child and other bits of it. I've not been so keen on so I kind of pick and choose the bits I like and, and try and ignore the bits I don't um, but I wouldn't necessarily want to live there because every generation some mad wizard pops up and tries to enslave the galaxy and uh, starts blowing up planets and everyone has to go to war and there's fascism and stormtroopers everywhere um, and bounty hunters and you can't go for a walk in the desert without some big thing coming and trying to eat you so uh, <laughs> i wouldn't necessarily want to live there but um star wars uh yeah probably favorite where i'd like to live probably star trek although you know it's i i, I don't work too well in command structures so maybe, mm. maybe i wouldn't get on too well um but it, it seems comfortable there and or um, going back the culture by in banks. So post scarcity, live on a great big general systems vehicle, tooling around the universe. Anything I want, you know, can change my body, can change anything at the drop of a hat, implanted drug glands to keep me happy. Um, no, you know, it would, that's kind of a, like a bit of a utopia. So wouldn't mind living there either, to be honest. <laughs> Certainly don't want to live like in the alien universe or mm. yeah, no nowhere like that. No. Here's a question from Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore itself. If you were asked to suggest a book not written by yourself that represents you, what would it be? Ooh, that's a really good question. And that's a question that has changed. Mm. several times during my life um i think when i when i was a teenager i was kind of obsessed with on the road by jack kerouac um but then i got a bit older in my early 20s i discovered uh generation x by douglas coopland mm. um which which kind of a lot of it chimed with my own experience and I, I identified with some of the characters in there quite strongly 
Um, and I still go back and reread that every few years because now it's gone from identifying with it to like reading it now is like having a conversation with my younger self. It's kind of nostalgic. So I'm kind of looking back at um, looking back at a, a character who was a bit like how I used to be. Um, so that's interesting. Sci-fi wise, I think Nova by Samuel Delaney had a huge influence on my writing um that it's it's some of it's a bit some of the science is a bit iffy now but the the book itself had a had a had a great um influence on me i, I, I don't know who else to you know I, I can't think of one book that would represent me completely i think there's i think at least a, a shelf's worth of books because mm. my kind of my mood and my what whatever i'm kind of my attention is on at any time, changes all the time. And, and uh, Cloud Atlas by um, David Mitchell is, I've read that about five or six times. I really like mm. that, bits of that. So, yeah, there, there, there's many books, and it depends what, what mood I'm in as to which book, which book I would choose, yeah. And I related to that. You recently came to America for the first time, and you mentioned a book that you were reminded of when you visited San Francisco. Do you want to talk about that series? Oh yeah, when when I was uh, when I was at school, I came across the Tales of the City by Armistead Morpan. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, which I think later got made into a TV show, but um, that that was about a house in San Francisco, run a boarding house, and the the characters within it. Um, and it follows them through their adventures. It starts with a, a sort of naive city girl coming to San Francisco and finding herself with a, a, la a landlady who smokes weed and uh, a, a young gay guy in the room next door and a, a lesbian in the uh, room on the other side and how she kind of gets thrown into this kind of um, the sort of sexual culture of San Francisco. And it was just really interesting books, but as a teenager, they really helped me come to understand different lifestyles and different sexualities and things that I had not necessarily run across at school because like in the eighties, you know, these things weren't talked about. Um, it, we had uh, section 28 in the UK, which was a law f f had been made a law that prevented the promotion of homosexuality in schools. So oh, schools gosh. weren't, schools weren't allowed to talk about it in the eighties at all. Um, so that was kind of that opened my eyes and that helped me understand and get a wider experience of the world, a, a better understanding of the world, which was, uh, and they were just fun, entertaining books as well. So some of the, some of the, some of the, they have some very silly adventures and they get into scrapes and there's lots of kind of soap opera ish relationship stuff going on. But yeah, it, going to San Francisco and sort of seeing the, those, um, streets really rem i hadn't thought of those books in years but that really reminded me of them well it's nice to know that you know the real world and the science fiction fantasy realm can kind of intersect through books and take us places and you've underlined why it's so important that you know young people have access to books about things that they might not know about otherwise so thank you for that perspective and i have come to the end of the audience questions unless we have anything more so Thank you very much and see if our host returns. Hi, Nick. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, you two. This was wonderful. I'm glad the uh, the internet I deity- I just say, I can't actually see or hear Nick. Oh, oh. <laughs> there, I promise. <laughs> I'm here in spirit. <laughs> I just have a little network, a little box with a network uh, oh. error in it, so. Okay. Yeah. I was going to uh, thank the internet deities for smiling upon us eventually, but it sounds like they're uh, still having a little bit of havoc, but um, yeah. I'm glad it, it did eventually steadied so we wouldn't have craziness. Uh, Gareth, thank you so much. I'm sorry that we couldn't you, get you here in person you. for your event, but I'm glad we were able to do something. Yeah. Thank you, Nick, for hosting this and allowing us to have the virtual event in lieu of what would have been an in-person event, which hopefully one day, we will have from Gareth at Mysterious Galaxy, and we'll see. So yes, thank you, thank, thank you Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you, Yo, thank, thank you. you. And thank you. as a reminder, at the bottom of the screen, 
you can click on there, buy a copy of Stars and Bones, and get a signed book plate, which is unique. And Mysterious Galaxy ships anywhere you want. So support an independent bookstore. Support Gareth L. Powell. Thank you, Gareth, and thank you, Mysterious Galaxy. Diane, you make my job a lot easier. Thank you so much. <laughs> Nick. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Gareth, have a wonderful good night. And I hope your okay. your cat will settle for the rest of the night. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully, the, hopefully Nico the cat will not disrupt it more. <laughs> moments, but I know, I know he will. <laughs> <laughs> all right everyone thank you so much for tuning in today thank i you. hope you have a great one thanks, thanks everyone for joining us thank you audience for the great questions too thank you